Hey there, this is your host, Matt Hunkler, and uh, you're listening to episode 128 of the Powder Cake Podcast. It is March 16th, and I'm on day six of social distancing, working from home here in my home studio to help flatten the curve and uh, really prevent more of the spread of the novel coronavirus, trying to be a good citizen here. Um, like you, I am online all the time following what's going on. Uh, I have my own anxieties. I have my own challenges with re- moving to fully remote. Uh, and if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that this is a podcast for entrepreneurs, leaders, and innovators who are building remarkable tech companies in areas outside of Silicon Valley. And uh, our team really tries to bring you the best information and experts to give you relevant, actionable insights. Today, given the circumstances, I wanted to bring back an episode that we released back in the summer of 2018. Um, This is with one of the foremost experts on remote work and thousands of companies, if not tens of thousands of companies, maybe even hundreds of thousands have made the decision to go fully remote in the past several days here, given what's going on with COVID and the coronavirus. Uh, It's likely that just as many companies will do the same in the weeks to come. Uh, So our guest today is from an episode, uh, again, back in the summer of 2018, uh, and it's Liam Martin, who is a pioneer in remote work, showing companies the right way to build and manage remote teams. For tech startups to scale-ups to large enterprises and teams, this interview is incredibly valuable, and I hope it's helpful as you are hopefully figuring out your own remote work situation, learning to get better and operate as a team. Uh, our team here at Powder Keg has gone fully remote here in the last couple of uh, days, and this advice was super helpful as we made the shift. Even though we've been re- remote friendly for the last several years, um, Liam Martin, who's a longtime friend of mine, uh, met him several several years ago. He's the co-founder of Time Doctor, a time tracking software that helps maximize productivity for remote, remote workers. He also co-founded Staff.com, which is an Inc. 5000 company, as well as the Running Remote Conference. So I'll be interested to see how they make that shift to digital conference this year. Um, All these accomplishments stem from Liam's experience building a software company with more than 80 employees spread out across 27 countries. I hope it's as helpful for you as it was for me um, and the rest of the Powder Keg team. And I want to let you know uh, if Powder Keg or I can be helpful at all in the coming days, weeks, months, as we all adjust to the new work situation, living situation, uh, please let us know. Uh, But for now, let's hear from my friend Liam Martin. Hey, Matt, thanks for having me, man. I, uh, it's, it's kind of crazy how things come together. I know back in 2012, <laughs> I attended the very first, I believe, powder keg. And um, that was a great conference. I loved that conference. But the thing I loved the most about that conference was how amazing your t-shirts were. They are the <laughs> softest, best merch I've ever had in my entire life. Whoever made your merch needs to be given a gold medal because it was absolutely (laughs) fantastic. It is the only conference t-shirt that has lasted five plus years of use. Dude, your shirt is looking uh, pretty good right there. And you definitely have like OG credit right there for being uh, an original powder (laughs) kegger. Uh, I remember you you flew in for that conference. You, uh, You knocked that speech out of the park. Um, and it was good to have you there. I remember we, uh, we we got up to some shenanigans there. I think there was a limo involved at one point, um, and we, we were definitely partying around Indianapolis where that conference was. So I, I love that you're rocking the powder cake tea today. Yeah, no, I I love Indy very much. It's it, it's very much Canadian esque. I think we have a lot of connections <laughs> in terms of our tech history, where it is a there's amazing things happening in Indy. There's amazing things happening in Canada. But people don't really pay attention to that. They pay attention to New York and SF. Yes. And there's a lot more in between that I think is uh, needs to be acknowledged and needs to be invested in. So um, I definitely saw that same kind of history between those two areas. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, and we've had some uh, amazing Canadian entrepreneurs on the show here before uh, in the past. Michael Litt from Vidyard uh, is one of them. Uh, growing just an amazing company up there. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, the startup tech scene in, in Canada, where you are. So <clears throat> the tech scene is, in Canada anyways, is really located around Toronto. And they, so you've got the Toronto Waterloo Valley. Mm-hmm. Waterloo is a great university that really pumps out 
a lot of fantastic talent, and then they kind of trickle down into Toronto. Okay. So that's where the that's where the nucleus is. And then you've got a lot of talent in Montreal. You've got a lot of talent in Ottawa. Ottawa has Shopify. Uh, a lot of people don't know that is that their corporate headquarters is located here. And that's, I believe, top five SaaS companies of all time. Wow. Uh, right now. So it's a it's a behemoth and it has thousands of thousands of employees and they are doing amazing things um, in Ottawa. And then you've got Vancouver. Um, that's really great in terms of just the general text. Well, Slack is from there yeah. as an example. And then you've got uh, Edmonton in Calgary that does some gaming. And the other thing that's really great about Montreal, going back to that, is uh, they have fantastic tax credits. So a lot of the huge video game companies are located out of Montreal. So oh. most of the, probably half of the AAA titles are coming out of Montreal because they just have so many dev houses there because of the tax credits that exist that in that city. Cool. So it creates a really interesting ecosystem. Um, so as an example, let's say you spend hundred thousand dollars on dev in Montreal, you're going to get 86 of those cents back as a tax credit. Wow. So it turns a hundred thousand dollar dev into a $14,000 dev. That's crazy. Um, yeah. And that's why a lot of that talent just sucks itself in there. And then I think in Toronto, it's 65 cents on the dollar. So it's a really great place to be able to build tech companies. Yeah. And there is a lot of talent. You'll you'll see, I was just speaking to one of the, um, a friend of mine who runs all of HR for GitHub. And GitHub is now deploying a major part of their dev budget inside of Canada because of those tax credits that they're able to, to kind of pull back in. So uh, Canada is kind of putting the thumb on the scale, but it is, uh, it's good for me <laughs> because yeah. I'm Canadian. Absolutely, man. Well, and, and, you know, as a Canadian, I, I'm, I'm curious kind of like what that culture was like for you when you were younger, like when did you kind of like get that entrepreneurial bug and, and how did that happen? Well, I was, I was always an entrepreneur and I came to, I kind of came out of the closet after, in the middle of grad school. Okay. What so, were you studying? Um, so I had run a business before university and I ran it through university and I was selling uh, sporting goods equipment. So this was before like Amazon and really even the, the internet existed, but it existed in a, in not the same state that it exists today. So I would, I had a really crappy website, <clears throat> never made a single sale through the website, but what I did was I would smile and dial my way through a whole bunch of retailers and try to sell my products into those retail stores. So that was my entire business model. And I was doing, I think one summer I did about a hundred grand, um, nice. which, was, which was awesome That's for a pretty... kid who's like 19. And it's just like, okay, you can sell a hundred thousand dollars worth of skate guards and, um, and skating pants. And that business ended up uh, getting to the point where I sold it to go to graduate school because my parents really wanted a doctor in the family. I was doing quite well in school. I liked school, or at least I thought I liked school. So I said, okay, how can I go to graduate school? I'm kind of out of money. Well, if I sell this business, I can. Sold the business, went to graduate school. And I remember I had been a teaching assistant for about five years, but then I was given my first actual class. So this is the first, like, you're not, a, you're not just a teaching assistant, you're a lecturer. So you're not quite a professor yet, but you're the person that actually gives the lectures. And I was so excited. Um, <laughs> I remember thinking, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to teach these guys and I'm going to be a, such a better teacher than everybody else. Long story short, I started with 300 students. It was a first year sociology class and ended up with about 150 at the end. Oh. Um, I, had a, I had a teacher review of 2.5 out of five. That's brutal. That was bad. That was really bad. I was yeah. not very good at it at all. Um, what, was just, the, what was the lesson you learned there? Don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the lesson? I walked into my supervisor's office and uh, I said, I don't think I'm very good at this. And he said, no, you're not very good at this. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, what do I do? And he's like, well, if you want to teach, which was my goal, 
well, my degrees were in sociology, so I wanted to teach. And he said, you're going to have to spend the next 10 to 20 years doing this until you can get tenure, in which case you don't really have to teach anymore. So you're either going to have to get quite a, a bit better at doing this or figure out something else to do. And I said, well, you know, what else should I do? And he said, well, you know, I don't know about that, but it looks like you've got a long road to go with regards to teaching. So I decided to uh, stop pursuing my PhD. I decided to get a master's degree instead, literally wrote 200 page on 200 pages on, I don't even know what it was about, threw it under my supervisor's desk. I think I got an A minus. And um, I then was kind of out in the wild and uh, started an online tutoring company because um, I really liked to actually educate people one-on-one. -on -one. I got a lot of engagement with individual students, but I was really bad at lecturing. What, what, did, you, so, what did you learn in that, like, getting engagement one-on-one? -on -one? Like, what were the things that made you good at that? And, and was that, like, an inherent skill that you had, or was it something that you learned? I'm <clears throat> slightly on the introverted scale, so I'm, like, a, a slight introvert mm -hmm. on the scale, and I think that that really helps me with interacting with individuals. So I would pick out individuals in lectures and have individual conversations with people in lectures. That's really stupid when you're supposed to be lecturing to 300 people. So I realized, and I was able to engage with a small group of students in a very deep way, yep. but then realized that I couldn't scale that out in a bigger way. So I like having individual conversations. Um, I can usually talk to people for about 15 minutes but when people start to talk to me this is one of the dangers that i always have with people uh, that are doing podcasts with me i can go off on tangents mm. so i need to be pulled back in to line so for me and tutoring getting pulled off on tangents is great because you can go down deeper into a particular subject so that was what i was i was good at and um i also was getting paid about $2,500 a semester to be able to lecture. And I could get $2,500 out of a single student over a semester. Ah, so, so I realized that there was an interesting scale point where I could say, well, you know, if I have 10 students, I'm making, you know, uh, 25 grand a semester. That's pretty sweet, right? Like I, that's a bit, at least I'm not going to go hungry. Yeah. And so that, long story short, turned into about 200 tutors throughout uh, Europe and North America. And one of the big problems that I had inside of that business was being able to properly identify how much work was being done. Mm. So uh, we were doing everything through Skype. And uh, that was we it was a virtual tutoring company. And that was a relatively new concept. And I, I had a big problem inside of the business, which was Jimmy says, uh, we bill Jimmy for 10 hours. Jimmy says, I only worked with my tutor for five hours. I go to the tutor and I say, did you work with Jimmy for 10 hours? He says, of course I did. So what I ended up having to do is refund Jimmy for five hours and pay the tutor for 10 hours. And that would mean that I would lose money on yeah. the deal. And that was a continuous problem inside of the business. So that, so when I did, uh, I was speaking at South by Southwest years and years ago and ended up connecting through a mutual friend of ours, Esprit. And Esprit had this mentor, this weird Australian guy, and he yep. had this crappy beta product, alpha product actually, that was able to not only measure how long someone worked, but it was able to measure all of the websites, applications, mouse movements, and keyboard movements connected to those actions. So there was a complete and incredibly clear documentation hmm. of what was being done inside of the business. And that to me was like, wow, that would totally solve the problem that I have inside of my current business. So we ended up uh, working together and uh, it's been, um, it's been 2012. It's been like five, it's been like six, six, six seven years uh, that we've been running Time Doctor and now staff.com, which is an enterprise product uh, and now running remote, which is, which is our conference. So, so can you we've really been, go ahead. I was going to say, can, can you kind of give me like the, the 30 second pitch on Time Doctor? Uh, we do a lot of pitches here at Powder Keg. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to like sell yourself or sell your business, but I'm, I'm, 
just curious to give us some context. I mean, you're talking about screen tracking, screen monitoring. Uh, you're mm -hmm. talking about virtual employees. Uh, give me kind of the 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 30 second. We just stepped into an elevator. Sure, it's accounting software for your time. And yeah, that was pretty good. That was like three seconds. <laughs> I've done this before. Oh, love it. I love <laughs> um, it. Yeah, no, it's accounting software for your time. So you wouldn't not measure how much money you make inside of your business. You wouldn't measure what your assets versus liabilities are, right? But you don't seem to do that with your time. So as an example, right now, I'm working on podcast. I've been working on it for 26 minutes and 32 seconds. I've been using Zoom for the vast majority of that particular task. And then I can drop that against all the other metrics that we have inside of the business or sorry, all the other podcasts that I've done. Mm -hmm. And I can see how efficiently I'm getting this podcast done in comparison to the other 60, 70 podcasts that I've done over the last couple months. So it allows me to not just figure out how long I've worked, but how efficiently I'm working. That's the real key and that's the difference. So let's say you have this data, right? You're, you know how many minutes you were working on this task um, it, it kind of gives you a report at the end of it. And then what do you do with that report? So you can build insights from it. So as an example, I can tell you with about an 89% accuracy rate, whether you're going to quit your job six months before you do. Wow. How do you do that? So machine learning, that's what we've been working on the last two years cool. is we have the largest second by second work database on the planet and we can very easily implement those types of uh, machine learning endpoints inside of our model. So for anyone that's interested in getting into artificial intelligence, and everyone talks about how machine learning is an artificial intelligence, but it is like, it's, it's just so complicated to kind of define what that truly is. So it's, it's AI. The big key for AI is the data. If you don't have the data, you can't do anything because the AI needs to learn off the data. Yep. So we just had a lot of data. We have six years of millions of users tracking every single second of their workday. Yeah. And from that, you can gain, you can throw even a very crappy AI onto it and it can gain insights pretty quickly. So that's how we've been able to do it. What are the things that you found that are correlated to a disengaged employee, you know, an employee that's going to quit six months from now, you know, is it highly correlated right. with a couple of things or is it just like, so it's very difficult to do that because of the way that AI works. Okay. So AI looks at like tens of thousands of different variables. So we might look at like, how long is a lunch break? Um, how often do you use Twitter? Do you use Twitter in the morning? Do you use it in the evening? Do you, you know, and it, they'll look at all these different variables and they'll just test they use, in essence, what's called like Bayesian algorithms versus um, uh, versus regression algorithms. And regression is here the human being thinks of the different variables that are going to affect the outcome. So I believe that wearing what color T-shirt you wear defines what you're going to eat for lunch. I've decided that that is a variable that's important. That's regression. And then Bayesian says, no, let's not have a human decide which variables are important let's look at all variables and then f and then the ai will actually tell you which ones have a positive correlation okay um so so as an example uh the first example of that being used was palantir and palantir very famously was be was able to say that there was a one in 11 chance that 9 11 was happening on 9 11 before it happened. Whereas everyone else was like, oh, the, they're not even seeing it on the radar, but yet Palantir is like, red alert, there's gonna be a terrorist attack. Yep. Because it was looking at all of these different variables that a human could never even perceive of. Mm -hmm. So we'll do something like, um, do people click the mouse in the bottom left-hand corner of their screen more? But we didn't look at that but the computer found that and was like, whoa, okay, that's interesting. Now, there might be something connected to clicking in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen that the computer is not seeing, but it is seeing a correlation for that. Gotcha. So it's difficult to say it, but I can give you some cool little uh, neat ones that, that we've found that are, that are kind of interesting. That'd be great. Um, porn, people go on porn on their computers. At work? Uh, at work, I didn't think that that happened 
as much as it did, but it does. Uh, the if people use porn, their chance of quitting goes down. Not <laughs> That's up. crazy. And I think it's because they're really secure in their jobs. Hmm. Like if you were super secure in your job and you're like, I got this, I'm coasting through. Yeah. Maybe you crack open a little bit of porn from time to time. <laughs> That's crazy. Right? Like maybe I, I, I'm theorizing, right? This is the, sure. this is the sociologist in me, which yep. is like, wow, I found this really interesting insight. How can I unpack it? How can I unpack that quantitative data set and turn it into something qualitative? I can only infer, um, unfortunately, since everything is encrypted on our side, we right. have no idea who those people are, but we do know on an aggregate side what data is being used. We know that there's porn usage. Right. Um, so that's that's an interesting insight. Well, and it's um, interesting and too because um, I, I think this goes back to sort of like what you um, – what you need to do with machine learning and AI, right? Like you can't just say, oh, there's a correlation between porn use and retention or em right. employee happiness uh, and say, well, therefore I need to make sure my employees watch more porn, right? Which is what a computer yeah, a would say. Pornhub, everybody yeah. do five minutes of Pornhub a day. Right, here's, here's your scheduled <laughs> right. time, make sure this happens. You have to have the human sociology, you know, like you need to interpret that data. What does that mean? Yes. And I think it's an important point to call out because it's, it doesn't have to do with just this particular instance of machine learning and, and drawing correlations with data. It's sort of like, what's the, what's the message behind the data? And, and you do that really well. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that we've had a lot of conversations with clients about, which is what is the definition of productivity? Mm. And it's, really insightful that almost every major company that we speak to has a different definition. What's the most common one? It's, it honestly changes from day to day. So as an example, I was speaking to a client last week, they have about 22,000 employees and they, uh, they run call centers. So they do like calling for, um, for sales on, on, on call sales outbound. <clears throat> and, their definition of productivity was obviously the amount of money that people make, mm -hmm. right? And they have this group that they call Platinums. And uh, Platinums were like their top 5% of their sales pool. And what they wanted us to do was to discover why Platinums are better than the other 95%. Okay. Is there a signal inside of the Platinums that the other people don't have? <clears throat> And the thing that we found, which was really insightful, is they work a lot less than everyone else. The one, the most important signal that we found is their average workday was about four hours versus everyone else was about six and a half to seven hours of on phone time and on computer time. Wow. So I was like, okay, interesting. Hmm. So I can't go back to them and say everybody should just work, seven, you know, twenty five percent less. That's probably not their not the answer that they want. Not gonna fly. Right? Not gonna fly. So then we, you know, we we're tunneling down a little bit deeper into this data, uh, and the the algorithms are chewing on it right now. But it's been a very interesting. It, those those types, all of those types of clients are very interesting because they don't have. A, the same definition of productivity. If I were to go back to them and, and truly and honestly, I would tell them, it seems to me like they are um, communicating clearer, let's say on the phone, uh, their ratio, actually another insight that we had is their ratio of on phone time was uh, higher inside of that four hours. Oh, wow. So they worked on average for four hours, but they spent more of their time on the phone. So, and their phone calls were, I believe a little bit longer, but that's not really statistically hi highly corollary to the outcome variable that we were looking at. Um, so we try to do that type of work all the time. That's more of our enterprise product than our, um, than our SMB product. But I just love tunneling into this data because you'll find these insights and you just think to yourself, okay, if I could only figure out why these guys are selling, and I'm talking these platinums sell on average twice as much as everyone else. So what if I could give you exactly what that person looks like 
And there we've built that for them at this point, or we're in the process of right. where they can now hire someone else and we can tell them within a month whether or not they're going to have a chance at being a platinum. What's the chance of them being a platinum after the first month of work? That's great. Yeah, that's what we're really excited about because we're using it primarily as an HR tool to be able to communicate to those guys and say, yeah, okay, well, I think that this guy has a 60% chance of becoming a platinum. You should probably invest in that person more. Or there's a 10% chance of them becoming a platinum. Maybe you should just cut, you know, cut this off right now. Let that person go and find somebody new to put your resources into. So I have to ask, um, you've seen all these insights. You've talked to all of these companies. You've seen these different definitions of productivity. What is your definition of productivity? Uh, widgets produced over time. Okay. Yeah. So talk to me like more about units that. produced over time. Uh, so let's say that I want to sell tickets to uh, runningremote.com, which is the best and most amazing conference ever in Abu <laughs> Bali about how to build uh, amazing remote teams. <clears throat> Not plugging at all. Let's say that that was the variable that I wanted to measure. Um, my KPI would be how many tickets I've sold. So then I could correlate that to my work use. So doing these podcasts as an example could apply to that. Yep. Where does it, how many podcasts did I make? How much time did I spend? How many tickets did I move? And then I, I connect that to the actual dollar amount that it cost this employee, which just, I also happen to be the founder and the owner of the business um, has. So that's to me is just the, the, the singular definition that I think everybody should be looking for is how can you figure out widgets production over time? Because if you can get that number below your costs, then you es- then you have escape velocity as a business. That makes sense. That, yeah. So I, that, uh, that's the only thing. I, I looked off camera over here. I, it wasn't that I wasn't paying attention to you, or maybe I was for a moment not paying attention to you, because I saw a question come in that I think is actually relevant to this conversation oh. um, okay. from Danielle McDowell. Um, who's an active member here at Powder Keg, amazing serial entrepreneur uh, and investor as well. Uh, her question was, what about their habits outside of work hours? I know that that's not what your software does, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, what are, how are they using those other hours? How does that affect their, their work hours? You know, what they're doing so outside of the nine to five. We don't measure any of that. Sure. Um, with GDPR coming, we've always been on the side of history, which is we don't want to, uh, secretly track people so if you you know if you pause our software there's a little task bar on time doctor and if you click stop you're not tracking any data um we've made that commitment so we are gdpr compliant and there's a lot of other apps that are not and but that also doesn't give us this advantage of being able to track what people kind of do in their off hours sure right but with that said Um, we've been doing a lot of experiments with like Fitbit as an example. Hmm. Can we correlate our Fitbit data? If you get 15,000 plus steps per day, are you a more productive employee? I'd love to be able to set that up. The problem is, is that these, these APIs don't talk to each other as easily as they should. And they could speak to each other very, very easily, but they don't because everyone wants to keep their proprietary data set proprietary. Yep. Which is, which is quite frustrating. Um, for, for us, I would actually, I would love to see a Zapier for APIs. That would be very cool. Where you could just say, I can, with one click, I'm going to opt in my Fitbit, my Time Doctor data, my Salesforce data, you know, my YouTube data, everything into this system. And then that user, if I, if Time Doctor connects to that user, I get all of those different data sets that then I can then add inside of my model. That would be amazing. That doesn't exist right now. I know it will exist in the next five years and it will probably be a, at least a hundred million dollar business. Oh, absolutely. For anyone that's listening, like, please build that. We'd be the first ones <laughs> to sign <laughs> up and, and say, okay, yeah, let's, let's work together to be able to make that work. So, but the big companies, they don't want to share their data. So we can share an individual Fitbit units data <clears throat> with us, but we can't get, the amount of aggregation that we need to really start to build those correlations. So t- your, to answer your question, I would love to know, we don't have the data yet to be able to do it. That makes sense. Well, and you mentioned your team, uh, and I think you were mentioning earlier, you have 80 some employees, is that right? Yes, in 27 different countries. 
27 so we different remote, countries. Yeah, we're a remote first company. Um, I have a small office here up in Canada. There's about five people in it. Uh, maybe two or three of them are there on a daily basis. Yep. So they kind of float in and float out. And then we also have offices in, uh, we've got a place in Abud, uh, which is where we're running our conference. We've yeah. got a place in Phuket. We've got a place in Sydney. Um, we've got a place in Manila. So we allow everybody to be able to travel between those spaces. So if you're a digital nomad, as an example, you can work for us. And our mission statement as a business has always been, we want to facilitate workers to work wherever they want, whenever they want. That's the mission statement of the company. So we should be eating our own dog food yeah. and facilitating that type of ease of movement across countries. That's really cool. I, and I love that approach um, of having kind of these, these um, offices that people can dive into as opposed to, you know, work where, well, you say work wherever you want. Does that mean you can uh, go to any one of these 27 offices in 27 countries? Or does that mean you can be at a Starbucks and be at work? Yes, you can be wherever you want. So okay. as I said before, it's widgets over time. So as long as you're keeping that, that, that ratio in line with everybody else, mm -hmm. right? So every single employee has a personal KPI that they need to reach. I don't care where you work. I don't care when you work, as long as you get your work done. Now, there's a couple caveats. If you're doing customer support, there's a shift that you've got to run, right? There's, yep. a, there's a set time that you have to be on support to be able to answer questions. Sure. But outside of that, honestly, if you want to work at three o'clock in the morning, that's cool. You have to show up to them. Now, there's another caveat. You have to show up to meetings. So if, you know, if I'm going to give you the freedom to go wherever you want on planet Earth, if I say we need to do a meeting and it happens to be three o'clock in your time zone, you got to do that meeting at three o'clock in your time zone. Sorry. Like that's that's just the reality of of running a company that has all of these different time zones, <clears throat> you've got to be able to show up. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, um, give people more freedom in their work. It makes them happier. Guaranteed. I have, I could put what who, the people that work for us against any other company. And I'm pretty sure we would come out happier on top. Um, and that just, <clears throat> that is, I would say primarily to remote work. And there's a lot of quantitative data to back this up. Mm -hmm where usually the primary reason for someone quitting is inter-office politics. They don't like their manager or they don't look like their coworkers. And this can allow them to interact with those coworkers. So we still have tension inside of our business, but it's not the same level of tension that you would see inside of a brick and mortar business because you're just not seeing those people um, angry at each other, you know, face to face and those, those fights, they break out in person, it can get quite bad. When they break out online, you can usually let both party cool down and then we can bring them back together later to, to kind of get everything uh, fixed up. So how does it affect, I just feel, how does it affect collaboration? You know, do you, it do does you feel like, so, do like you feel collaboration's like you're, lower. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Definitely. Um, collaboration's lower. Okay. It, it's like, <laughs> it, it, there's, there's pros and cons. Um, pro. You don't have to have an office. So every employee is about 25% cheaper, even if you're paying them the same salary. Another pro is I'm not looking for the best $5,000 developer in Indy. I'm looking for the best $5,000 developer on planet earth. And usually your $5,000 will be better spent if you have a global stage as opposed to a local stage. First of all, where do you find a $5,000 developer? Um, I'm sorry, $5,000 a month, like a 60K <laughs> developer. Yeah. Just giving you you a could time. find a five thousand dollar developer, I, I'm sure. Right, but they probably would not be very good. No, you'd get uh, yeah, you'd get a pretty crappy one. So, um, so that so you want to be able to to those are those are some major pros. Some major cons are you collaboration is slower, uh, human communication is slower, um, gaining insights into how different people work is mm. usually a little bit slower. So we still do huge team retreats. So the entire company comes together once a year, and then we have smaller team retreats in, uh, in different countries for different departments, because we've recognized that that does actually really help with just accelerating the team. Even just like, I didn't know that you were six foot two. Oh, wow, you're really tall. 
um, oh, you, you know, here's the way that you move. Or when I tell you something that you don't like, you do this nonverbal cue with your face. Mm -hmm. And now that I've seen you in person, I know that that's what's happening when we do a face-to-face uh, Skype call. Yep. in the future, these little things that you kind of pick up on and you only have to have a little bit of face-to-face -face time to really kind of get the advantages out of that. It's expensive, but um, it does still, it's still much cheaper than doing it all under the same roof. Can you, um, can you tell me a little bit opinion. about what that one day looks like? Is it one day? You said once mm -hmm. a year. Is it a day? Is it a multiple day thing? It's about a week. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's we kind of run around little mini conference. Cool. So each department figures out where they're currently at. We talk about where we were last year, where we want to go this year, uh, what new programs we're going to implement, what new features we're going to deploy. And then we talk a lot about just our personal lives, you know, kind of just get people all together in the same space and, uh, and, and get them to chat. So outside of one, we have two days of full on presentations, kind of like a conference. And then we have another two days of just kind of relaxing and chilling out. What, uh, the first time you hosted one of these, did everything go smoothly or were there some mistakes that were made? Uh, yeah, the first couple of times, the first one was horrible. Why, we we set up a whole bunch of, we set up a whole bunch of games. Um, it, so I think we also kind of even needed to figure out our own culture as it applied to us when we're in person, when we're all in the same room, which was interesting. Yeah. Like I'm not a, Hey, let's play games. Right. Like, um, I can't remember. Could have fooled me at South by. What? You yeah. said you could have fooled me at South by. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so there I'm in a social mode as opposed to like, huh. I'm just, so the other thing too, I think is I realized the first time we did one of these things, I'm like, okay, this is like, this cost us 50 grand to get everybody in here for a couple days. That's a pretty big company expenditure. I want to make my money off of this. And I, and I'm rolling through my head. Okay. How many Facebook ads could I buy? And what's, what's the ROI on that for 50 grand versus this, what I'm spending on right now. And so we went from a very much, and it's also weaving different cultures together. That's the other thing that's kind of nuts is uh, some cultures say, well, we want to be able to, we're going to bring you a gift because you're coming to, and I don't care about that. Last time we did one, I got like 50 things, like little, little baubles, right? Little things. And I, and I really appreciate it, but I have to buy another piece of luggage just to get back to Canada right? Because now I have 50 more little things. I don't need that. I don't need you to give me that. What I need is for you to kind of be tuned in and focused, but there are other cultures that really like that. So other cultures want to be able to spend a day just kind of going around the area. For me, I, because I do traveling, I travel all the time. I don't want to do that. I really want to focus in on like what we're currently doing and staying focused. Mm -hmm. So Tying in all of those little problems were a big issue. In the first year, I delegated it to somebody else, and then we kind of like slowly crafted it. And now we're four to five years in when we've been doing these. And the fifth one we're actually going to be doing um, before running remote. So we're going to bring the entire team down to Abud, and we're going to be doing our, our meetings there. <clears throat> and then we're going to be doing the conference afterwards. And for us, now we've got it tied in where we have very specific presentations by department heads. And then uh, we have team building exercises. So we'll usually do about, we, we started with about two days of team building and now we're down to like an afternoon. Okay. So it's just kind of tweaking where you want to be. And it really depends on who you are as a business. Uh, I think that's probably another big part. Like if you're a Tony Shea, you probably want to do a ton of team building, right? Like that's really important to who you are as a business. But if you are introverted Liam, you probably don't want to do that. You want to be on the side of saying, okay, I, we've spent all this money. I really want to be able to make sure that we get as much deep work done and deep thinking done as humanly possible over these next couple of days. Well, what are some of the things that um, remote working teams don't do well? I mean, I, I heard the stories, you know, of, you know, IBM went all remote. Now they're kind of like reversing that, um, yeah. which I assume means that it didn't go well for them. Um, right. What do you see are some of the, like the biggest mistakes in working remotely? 
So for small businesses, uh, and I'm sure we've got a mix here for the powder keg community, but for small businesses, it is the importance of documentation. Mm. So putting all your processes down, making sure that you can communicate those processes virtually and then communicate them over time and space. So just because you've hired John, let's say John is right next to you and he's a new employee, you see John doing something, you can very quickly jump in and say, John, that's not how you do it, you do it this way. But when John is 10,000 miles away, you have to be able to create documentation. And let's say also John is 12 hours difference from you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to be able to make sure that you can talk to John and you can interact with him on a day-to-day -day basis. And the only way that you can do that is through virtual documentation. So put it inside of a Google Doc. I'm sure that pre pretty much everybody that's in tech right now has, uh, has um, Google Apps. <clears throat> it's great, put them into a Google Doc. Uh, throw them up and then have a folder of all of your different operational procedures. And then if somebody has any questions, they can always query that database as opposed to kind of being frozen for 10 hours and not really knowing what to do next. Yep. That's a really good thing for facilitating things. A um, couple other ones is just general could, communication, obviously, I, which we've touched on, which are slower. Can I actually but, ask a follow-up question to that documentation sure. piece? Because um, I, I've kind of struggled with this myself, right? In terms of wanting to in that documentation get really specific about everything right like um i think about it as almost like the mcdonaldization of whatever that task is so uh that's ritzer yeah mcdonaldization of society that that's the and he specifically if you if you want to kind of uh look at a great book on specifically process design it's called mcdonaldization yeah so, Google so you, it, you, you and it's you, great. That is your approach then is to get very specific as opposed to some quick bullet points that sort of like, it's going to look generally like this. Uh, you should make sure you don't skip this, this, and this and, and make it simple and <clears throat> approachable. Yeah, so here's, here's a big difference. And this is something else that I kind of has turned into a bit of a company idiom. <clears throat> Instructions should not be easy to understand. They should be impossible to misunderstand. Uh, that's a good maxim to live by. It's a little by. click. It's a little, it's a little shift in your thinking, but then it is, instead of writing in the instructions, please open up WordPress. Instead, I would hyperlink that and send it to another process on how to open up WordPress so that everything is super clear, super focused. Um, I have a process that's called the four D's, which is basically just discover, design, deploy, and debug um, on how to build a process. So you discover why the process exists. You discover why it was done that way. Maybe it was done that way for very stupid reasons. And then you need to kind of reorient that, that process. Then you need to design it. Uh, I have the rule of three, which is do it once yourself, the second time you do it, think about the process that you're going to write. And then the third time you do it, write down the process. I love that. So that it's just documented. And the reason why you do it the third time and not the hundredth time is because on the hundredth time, you forget all of the little details inside of the process because you've done it a hundred times. So you don't know all the steps. So if you have a, a coach, as let's say you have like a, a workout coach. I don't want the guy that's been 6% body fat since he was two and is 220 pounds. I don't know if you know uh, Steve Cam from nerdfitness.com. Yes, okay? I do. Steve is a horrible coach. When I go out and work out with him, he's just like, oh yeah, just do these backflips and do these handstand pushups. Don't worry about it. You're good. Okay. How do I do that? I'm not you, Steve, right? <laughs> I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not like a ninja warrior God. Uh, I'm just a regular dude that Not wants to party in Vegas, right? Like <laughs> that was that was my experience with Steve last year. Instead, what I want is the guy who was 250 pounds and you know couldn't lift 100 pounds above his head, and now the guy is 180 pounds of steel. A year later, that's who you want to learn from. That person is going to be way better for you than the guy that's never been in that place before. Yeah. So you want to be able to figure out where you are and then figure out people that have accelerated out of where you are to where you want to be as quickly as possible. And that's who you should hire. And those people are actually really cheap because no one pays attention to them anywhere near as well as the people that have always been amazing. 
So like, as an example, let's say you've got someone, let's say you're in a business right now where um, let's say you're doing 5 million a year and you know, you're growing 10% per year as an example. And for tech, that's probably not very good. Yeah. Don't talk to a guy that's been growing 120% year over year in the last three businesses that he's done and built $300 million businesses. Talk to the guy who was at 10 million a year and the business was, was falling apart. And now it's a hundred million dollar business four years later. That's the person you want to talk to because that's the person that's going to be able to get you out of your problem even though that person may not sound as sexy as the one that's always succeeded. That's really good. So, that's really helpful advice in terms of, I mean, one, in terms of documentation, but two, in terms of like learning at a company and, and thinking about yeah. how, um, how to train. Uh, what are some of the other like bigger mistakes? I, I know you probably see a lot of them uh, with remote, remote working. Yeah. Uh, so communication is a big one. Um, not, respecting the different cultural conditions of of different societies mm. um, that's another one that's pretty big so as an example uh, if I'm talking to our team from the Philippines Filipinos are very agreeable their their agreeableness rate is higher than um, Ukrainians as an example there's a polar opposite okay if you want to talk we have we have a dev house in Kiev you can't if if you're nice to a ukrainian at the very beginning of a relationship that ukrainian will proceed to walk over you forever uh because that's just the and, and i'm and i'm very i'm being very politically incorrect here but i'm just talking about and if you go and check out some anthropological data on this and some sociological data on this they'll i mean it'll back up my perspectives on it and i'm trying to teach as opposed to be politically correct. Sure. But uh, so with Ukrainians, you need to say, hey, this is the way we're doing things. And the Ukrainian will push back saying, no, we're not doing it that way. We're doing it this way. I'm like, nope, I'm the boss. <laughs> you can choose to do it the way that I want to do it, or you can choose to leave the company, make a decision. And then after that kind of tension, which probably Americans and North Americans are a little that's a little bit of a tense interaction. Yep. Then they're like, Oh, that guy's cool. I, I guess I'm not going to screw around with him anymore. Yeah. Right. It's a very, it's so interesting. Whereas if you did that in the Philippines, you would, they would feel very uncomfortable because they're very agreeable and they're very nice people. They're very loyal people, but they will not tell you when they disagree with you. Mm hmm. So in the Philippines, as an example, I don't tell people, what do you like about this process? As an example, I tell, I tell them, give me your top three reasons why this process will not work. Cause I, I restructure the question because if you just say like, what do you like about, what do you not like about this? They'll say, oh, everything's great. Mm -hmm. no, no problem. Yeah. Okay, cool. But like, tell me your top, if you had a top three of things that you didn't like about this, what would they be? Oh, I don't really want to tell you. Yeah. You need to tell me that's your job. You need to tell me why this is not going to work. Tell me now. And then they'll come out with it and you need to have them more comfortable with that. And they also need to adjust to my culture, which is like, particularly in the United States, the ability to be able to debate with a manager, as an example, is something that's a lot more acceptable here than it is in Southeast Asia in general. Sure. And that's something that you need to kind of, and for us, it's really great because then we, we get a better product out the other end. But in the Philippines, as an example, or, or the rest of Southeast Asia, it's just not done. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to adjust to those things. So I think, yeah, culture is another one that's really important too. Uh, if, if you're adopting a, a work culture, um, you know, beyond going to, uh, to your conference, which I do want to get to in just a second. Um, if you're adopting a remote work culture, which we're doing here at powder keg, right? Like we're, um, most employees are here in our Indianapolis office, but we're traveling all the time, right? Like we're launching conferences all over the country this year. Um, we have a remote worker based in the Philippines, Derek, uh, who's been with the company for two or three years, but we want to have more. Uh, people across the country here and maybe even around the world uh, as we scale. What are some of the things that companies need to do um, to grow and scale a remote work culture? 
they need to, uh, outside of documentation, which is like, in my opinion, for second and third priority, yep. to be honest with you. Okay. The, the issue with regards to documentation is most Fortune 500 companies already have documentation because they can afford to do it. Right. <clears throat> Small businesses don't see that as something that's really important for them. And they can get by for a really long time without documentation because they're a small business and there are more important things in front of them. Right. But for a remote business, just think that you're now, you have to document like a fortune 500. Right. Basically. Right. Cause those humans are now distributed all over the planet. You can't really measure what they're doing on a, you're not seeing them face to face. So you need that documentation so that they very clearly have those instructions. So once mm -hmm. that's done, you need to understand culture. You need to understand how those different, you know, communities facilitate, um, the, the culture facilitates communication basically. And then the third one would be actually building out the tool set that you would need your technology stack. So what are the best um, tools other than time doctor, obviously. Right. So, uh, <laughs> like I would say, there's a big debate now going around synchronous versus asynchronous communication. And there's a lot of good data coming out saying that synchronous communication is maybe not the best idea hmm. in the world. Um, because give me an example you, of that. I got a phone call last night at three o'clock in the morning saying that there was a, we have a, uh, a red alert text button. I think we call it the red alert button. Um, we have like really nerdy names for everything. <laughs> so, which sounds is, like it would culturally th fit with you. Yeah, yeah, totally. There, there's <laughs> a, there's an attack, um, happening. Someone's trying to, to attack our servers. Uh, so I get that phone number or I get that text if um, Rob is unreachable on his time zone. So Rob, my co-founder is in Australia, I'm in North America, and we're usually on either side of the planet. So anyone can make that type of decision to say, okay, we need to take some serious action. Maybe we need to shut down servers as an example to stop this from happening. So um, that's an example. Getting messages, we've really tried to get everybody to uh, outside of Mondays, which is kind of our meeting days, every other day of the week, shut off your phone, shut off your work phone once you're past 5 p.m. Like just try to have a block hours of uh, a block set of hours for work mm -hmm. and don't have those messages infect your life outside of that environment. It's really important, I think, to be able to keep a work life and a social life. And it's very difficult when you work from home yeah, because you're just, you know, they kind of bleed into each other, but it's very important to just close the laptop, go out into another room and have a social life at Friday night, you know, at 6 PM, don't constantly be getting more messages about closing a deal. It, it's just, I, I've, I think it is creating a lot of stress in work and it's creating a lot of stress in brick and mortar businesses as well. It's the same problem, but because everyone's remote, they, I feel like they have more of an opportunity to be able to abuse that worker and be able to say, yeah, well, I know it's Saturday night, but can you do this for me right now? No, fuck you. I'm not doing that. <laughs> like, I'm going to go to, I, I'm on a, I'm at a water park right now to yeah. hell with you. I'm going to go and, and, do what I want to do, um, which is go and hang out at this water park. That was so, like two weeks ago. So tools like Slack are good. Slack is good. However, it's synchronous. Yeah. So like, don't have Slack on your phone, right? Get it off your phone, put it on your desktop, have it on, have it there, have it be able to shut down or use if this, then that to be able to disable notifications, you know, after a certain time, um, another app you might want to check out is twist. Hmm. Twist is pretty good. It's by the founder. Uh, it's by Doist. Amir from Todoist was actually going to be at Running Remote as well. Oh, cool. And he's really big about, so Twist is like Slack, but it's asynchronous Yep. instead of synchronous. So it's very much designed to be able to allow people to engage in deep work. Yep. Removing all of the distractions, removing all the beeps and bops. I, I personally believe that we live in what I'll call like the distraction economy. I agree. So it, the companies that are the best at, uh, the companies that make the, the most money are the best at distracting you. Like there's a perfect correlation between those two groups. I've been studying mobile apps just recently for another project that we're working on. And there is a massive amount 
uh, like people are making billions of dollars a month selling games like Clash of Clans. Uh, and I've, I've installed these games and I got addicted to them over a three month period because I was interested in studying how they work, but they sucked me in. Even though I knew mindfully, I was like, oh, I'm studying this to just figure out how these distractions work. They sucked me in and I ended up having to delete all of these games from my phone. They're amazing <laughs> at getting your attention yep. and your attention is really valuable. Do you want to spend your time building your business or do you want to spend your time playing Clash of Clans? I'd rather have it doing the business. I know that my like conscious mind wants to do that, but my unconscious mind is like, oh, I just got a, a cute little beep sound on my phone and it looks like my elephant is getting attacked or, or whatever it might be. And I have to go on the phone right now to solve that problem and pull myself out of productivity. Yeah, Massive distraction and you need to get rid of it in your workflow. It's hard to stay present if you're uh, constantly being Absolutely. bombarded. Well, so uh, shifting gears a little bit, Liam, I wanna make sure you can talk to me a little bit about running remote uh, because one, uh, I might wanna attend. Uh, two, uh, it sounds amazing. It's in Bali in tree houses. Yeah. <laughs> can you kind of give me the, the over, overview here? Like what, what are you doing? <clears throat> this sounds crazy. So we, I've wanted to do this for about five years. Uh, as I said, our mission statement is we want to empower workers to work wherever they want, whenever they want. And uh, we are at 80-ish people right now. We want to get up to 200 people within the next year and a half. How do you do that? How do you hire all these people remotely? What's the playbook? And so we started asking people that were pretty good at hiring remotely. And it was interesting because we started getting different opinions. We'd have one very successful company and they would say, doing, doing uh, meetings with video is the only way that you should do things. You shouldn't do it any other way other than that way. And the very next company that we spoke to says, oh, you shouldn't do that at all. That's a horrible, horrible idea. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty confused here. There's no playbook. There's no best practices yet because it's so new. Yeah. Let's there's no conference about this either. There's no conference that exists about building this, these best practices. That's kind of crazy. So we said, okay, let's just do it. It was a ready fire aim mindset. Uh, we just got the space and we, uh, we said, okay, let's try to put people in the space. Um, we're about 70% sold out right now. We've got about two and a half months before it goes live. So I think we're, <laughs> we're pretty darn close to, selling out completely. Um, and it's going to be in a booth network of tree houses made out of bamboo. And we're able to hold a couple hundred people in the main tree house. And it's going to be, uh, Joel from buffer. Uh, the founder of buffer is going to be doing a talk. Amir from doist, uh, the, the to doist app is going to be doing a talk, GitHub, GitLab, um, bunch of other fantastic companies. And it's all about how are we going to build that playbook for the future? So if you want to hire people more efficiently and you're a remote business, this is the conference that you want to go to. Who it's not for is if you don't manage any remote employees, this is not the conference for you. There are a lot of digital nomad conferences that you should totally check out. There's dozens of them and they're all amazing. And that movement has just been exploding. We're not that. We're the the conference for the employers, not the employees. So that's what we want to kind of communicate to everybody because we've had a lot of people that have signed up that don't manage anybody. And we've, we've been refunding their tickets mm -hmm. uh, because we just don't want, we want the right type of people in the room. Um, because for me, what I want to do is just, I have a, uh, there's a woman who's coming who uh, she's attending and she could be speaking at the conference. She manages 13,000 remote employees. Wow. And I want to just crack her head open and, and figure out what's inside um, because her breadth of experience in facilitating that is, is amazing. Yeah. So that's the type of people that we want to have at the conference. And not to say that, you know, you don't have to have 13,000 people. You can manage one person. It's just if you want to, if you're at one person, you want to go to two or three, this is the conference to go to. Okay. That's awesome. And so it's going to be talks, workshops, um, lots that's of ne it. networking opportunities yeah. for people to learn from each other. We have the, uh, we just actually booked the um, ambassador to Estonia and he's going to be speaking about 
how the Estonian e-residency can facilitate not only remote workers, but also remote businesses. So mm. now you can have an East, an Estonian um, corporate structure set up and it will be 10% corporate tax. So all of your assets can go into that Estonian new kind of digital and they're running, their entire system runs through blockchain. It's wow. really innovative. Wow. So all your banking, all your taxes, everything is facilitated through this single number that you have that's that's reinforced by by the blockchain and uh i think it's just a, an amazing model that i think a lot of people will be able to 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 go after so i'm very excited about that um we have a bunch of different people from you know you just got to go to runningremote.com to check it out because cool. we're always adding more speakers yep uh and more experiences but uh it, it's something as i said i've been working on for the past five years and for us it wasn't necessarily about the money it was just can we actually make something that can help us get from <clears throat> where we are now to where we want to go? Well, and I, I definitely recommend people check out runningremote.com if for nothing else to watch the video of like these awesome tree houses. Uh, <laughs> so def definitely check that out. Uh, Liam, if people want to find you and engage with you on social media asynchronously, of course, yeah. where, would they, where should they go? You know what? I, I've been really loving Instagram lately. Cool. Um, so like you can hit me up on Instagram. Um, I'm uh, I'm just Liam Martin, you know, Google Liam Martin on Instagram and you'll find me. Okay. And uh, I love that. I don't know about you, but like just the last kind of year or so with Instagram stories, I feel like it's just becoming the place. And I'm, I know that I'm too old to kind of interact with the Instagram space. Like that's the younger, you know, generation and I'm no way, man. more on Facebook, but no like, way. Man, Instagram is is killing it right now. So I'd love to be able to have more conversations on there. So if anyone wants to kind of chat, let's do it through there. Cool. We'll link it up in the show notes. Uh, and we'll link it up here if you're watching on Facebook Live uh, as well. That way you can uh, connect with Liam. Liam, thanks so much for being here. Uh, well, not here, but being in Canada and taking time uh, to, to dial in uh, with, this, with this Facebook Live stream. Uh, of course, you can find all the show notes uh, here uh, if you're watching live in a couple of weeks, if you're listening to the podcast at powderkeg.com. Uh, please make sure you check out Running Remote. Uh, it sounds like they're doing it uh, pretty regularly. So if you missed this year, there's always next year. Um, and check out uh, Liam Martin. Hit him up on uh, Instagram and, and connect with him and some of his companies. Uh, thanks again, and we'll talk to you next time. That's it for today's episode. Please stay safe out there. Uh, if you can, work from home to help flatten the curve from the spread of the novel coronavirus. Use some of the tips from this episode to be more productive and help your team be more productive. I want to give a big, big, big thanks to Liam Martin, who uh, you can follow on Twitter at VTA Method Man. That's V as in Victor, T as in Tango, A as in Alpha, plus Method Man, all one word. And uh, you can always head to the show notes on powderkeg.com. That is a place where you can find links to all the people, resources, other things mentioned in this episode. You can learn more about Liam and his ventures. And for more stories on entrepreneurs, leaders, and professionals in areas decidedly outside of Silicon Valley, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes at powderkick.com slash iTunes. Thanks for listening to this special uh, repurposed episode. I hope it's helpful here uh, for you in the coming days, weeks, and months. And uh, please keep your feedback coming. We want to be giving you relevant and timely information. So we've got some special guests lined up for the shows to come. But obviously, I always want to hear from you. So hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, wherever. I'm just at Hunkler, H-U-N-C-K-L-E-R. Um, this is Matt Hunkler signing off, and I'll talk to you next week on Powder Keg.